Warning, this episode of the podcast reviews novels with adult content, including graphic sex, harems, reverse harems, graphic language, and more naughty themes. I'm Wilford Brimley. You may remember me from such classics as John Carpenter's The Things, The Things, The Thing, yes, The Thing, and Remo Williams' The Adventure Begins, where I play Agent Smith, way before another guy played Agent Smith. I'm here today to talk to you about feline diabetes. It's a very important thing. If you know about diabetes with felines, you know it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. And I have a very, very powerful story to tell you all. But first, I have to say, hello everybody. Welcome to the RPG Audio Podcast. I am Ray, and uh, before we begin the show, I do want to say that this episode, as you can see, is going to be very special as I have grown in my porn stash. And I do think, I do think... That this will be the last time I grow in my mustache this thickly. Um, simply for the fact that you can see now. Um, before it was nice and dark. And I think that uh, now it's looking older. Uh, I think that my near-death experience has kind of tainted me. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I think I'm not going to do a porn stash for any more naughty specials. It's just too much. So I'm sorry about that. But this is a very special episode. It is going to contain things like adult content. Um, concerning books that can get fairly graphic, hence the name The Naughty Special. So this is rated R. So Ramon, if you can put that R rating up, you can see it's not for kids. It really is not. Um, And it may not be for everybody. And I I don't like to do series specials that are just kind of focused on one thing all the time. Um, But uh, I have had requests for this. Um, So I thought I would do another Naughty Special. Uh, so if you're not into harem type books or explicit sex, then this may not be the show for you because we will talk about those things here. Um, you know, so you could just jump to my last review, uh, which will be The Heroic Villain by uh, Charles Dean. Uh, the rest of the episode deals with adult topics. Uh, not that Charles Dean's book is an adult, but um, it is not nearly as graphic or powerful. There is some discussion about boobies in it, though. Um, so if... Uh, if, if that's okay with you, uh, I will be reviewing some naughty by nature literature, lit RPG books today for you. Lit RPG audiobooks. So let's get right to it and begin the naughty show. Or it's a naughty special. It's a very naughty episode that contains absolutely no feline diabetes. And yes, this is my best Wilford Brimley impersonation that I didn't know I could pull off. Okay. Although, in the thing, he didn't really have a mustache, did he? He was totally stashless. He was shaved for the thing. Okay. Well, we're going to get right to it, everybody. In just a few moments, the special naughty episode of the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast will begin. All right, pretty babies. Next up, I know you've all been waiting for this one. Remnant by Randy Darren. Narrated by Andrea Parsnow with a book length of 13 hours and 18 minutes. Steve blinked twice and looked around. He was standing in the middle of what looked like a bare dirt field. To the west of the field was the start of a forest. In the south, a decently sized lake. To the north and east were empty fields of grass. Where the hell am I? Steve asked. Looking down at himself, he could see he was wearing a black windbreaker, brown shirt, dark blue jeans and work boots. Just what exactly is going on? He said to no one, as no one was around. Steve was completely alone here, in this field. Off to one side of him were two large wool sacks. Beside that was a large, open-topped wooden toolbox. Moving over to inspect it, he found more or less what his mind had told him should be inside. Various small and medium-sized tools, like hammers, chisels, mallets, a saw, and other things he wasn't even sure of the use for. Well, here is another book by Randy Darren. <coughs> Rand, oh, excuse me. And it's not exactly what you would expect from him. Uh, the book starts off a bit as a mystery as the MC Steve uh, wakes up with barely any memory of his past. He, I think the only thing he really remembers is his name is Steve. Um, (laughs) So he really doesn't have a lot to work with. Um, He discovers via message left by 
past Steve that he's had his memories traded for some rather awesome and powerful gear. Um, farming gear, to be exact and certain, um, with the message that he needs to build himself a nice little farm and, if possible, a village as soon as possible. Now, it, it, it really is not long, because this is, is Randy Darren, uh, before Steve finds himself embroiled in a mess of forbidden love, because he is the love broker. Um, love. Love with non-humans. And everybody knows that love, true love, is what brings us together today. So, um, his love for these non-humans only grows until he earns a title. Now, in the book, you get titles for doing certain things. His title is called Zookeeper, uh, because in this world, uh, interspecies love is very, very forbidden. Now, I'm not talking he's having sex with farm animals, like, you know, like uh, Dolly the sheep, who's been cloned, so she's not going to talk because she's been cloned, and you can do what you want and get rid of her and bring in one, another one. Let's just like her and doesn't have a clue what happened. Um, no, not Dolly the sheep. Um, these are like half-human hybrids, whether it's a, a naiad in the water or, you know, a, a, a nymph or a sylph or a satyr or whatever you want to do. The naiads, uh, nagas, those are all things that are fair game for Steve, uh, even though he knows he's not supposed to do the deed with them. He just doesn't understand why, because what? He doesn't have memory, so he has no clue why he shouldn't do such things. So, lacking the memory, he is rather uninhibited. Uh, thankfully, this, the combo of Steve's incredible strength and gear pretty much makes him a force not to be trifled with. Uh, and he just kind of goes about his business trying to accumulate wives and territory while fighting this really cool zombie invasion, uh, which is brought about by this evil mist. Um, and then he also has to stab off like territory disputes with his neighboring uh, cities and towns and stuff. Um, the story pretty much follows this route. Steve builds a farm while accumulating women as he fights either soldiers or zombies. That's the path. Um, you get some construction and town building in addition to the harem building. And I can just say that this is some of the fastest harem growth I have ever seen any author perform. Uh, it, I've, I've never seen it in one novel, to be honest with you. There's so many women that um, pop up that he has ended up making into wives or girlfriends or just whatever. Uh, people that he taps on occasion, uh, you know, best friends with benefits, you know, booty calls, whatever you want to call it, um, there is a hella lot of ladies in this book. I, I, I almost felt like I needed to, like, you know, get out a pen and paper and write down, like, who's where, what they do, you know, what their likes and dislikes are, how many stars they get for this or that. And so, you know, keyboards are in this book, and, you know, he's rubbing their bellies and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of different things in the book uh, that, you know, he, he adds in for spice and flavor. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to say it in a negative way. I'm just saying, like, hell, he goes from none to, like, ten before the book even comes close to getting finished. I mean, like, ten ladies, ten wives, whatever you want to call them, there's a hell of a lot of them. Um, and mind you, he didn't actually sleep with all of them, uh, not in the book, but in this book. I'm sure he will in the next book. Uh, there were some he kind of just set aside for later, I suppose. He's like, you know, these is my side chicks. I'll get to them later. Later, shorties. You know, that kind of stuff like that. Um, he plans on doing a tapping. You know, he's, he's going to be a tap dancer. He's going to tap that stuff. Um, tap that keg. Tap that. There's, you tap something. Okay, wait. You tap the keg. You tap... Tap, tap. I don't know. Soft shoe. Anyway, he's got to. He's going to tap them later. Um, so there, there's a lot of ladies there, and, and yeah, the, the sex is kind of graphic. Uh, it's very well described. It's it's decently executed, and it builds the story because um, with his main woman, his number one wife, uh, which is his first forbidden love. Uh, their sex has has a very special significance for both of them. Uh, she takes it to mean very specific things. 
and you know she takes it to heart and he does the same like he realizes he loves her at some point before he realizes he loves her i mean he's like wow holy crap i had no clue i guess i do i I love her a lot um so it's it's nice to see that even though the sex is kind of graphic it's not and again i'm not trying to say this in a negative way it's not fostering thought fostering faust kind of sex um this is this is graphic sex but it's not like you know I'm gonna do this to you and, and make you do this to somebody else. You know, it's very consensual, 100 percent of the way. Uh, everybody enjoys it. Not that they don't enjoy it in Faust, but uh, I think you understand what I'm saying. It's it's more of an emotionally based thing than it is a manipulatively based thing, and that makes a big difference. Um, but again, I enjoy both books. So you know. What do you want me to say? I like it um, one way or the other, whether it's the naughty stuff from Faust or the naughty stuff from here. Um, it's a different flavor. It's a different spice, um, but it's still there. It's still there, and it's delicious. Um, this world, I have to say, is pretty interesting uh, as it has game ru- game-like game rules and pop-ups and magic gear uh, that is soul-bound, so it allows for the acquisitions. Also, like I said before, of of various titles. Uh, it also has a mystery of what created or who created or guides the strange, creepy mist that make the dead walk or just materialize out of dead, uh, thin air. Uh, also, you have to wonder, why is this watering can so powerful that it can affect these zombies in the way that it does, that it can change the very land in the way that it does, the water the way that it does? I mean, he's got some really massively OP items. Like, his pick, and, you know, he goes out and he just mall stuff with his simple garden tools you know if this dude came at me with a hoe i would be running the other way because he would be cutting you in half with a hoe um or cultivating you in half i would say um but yeah i mean there, there's a lot of things that happen um that you have to ask why is he so strong uh, what events did he fail at so badly that it caused steve to reset his life because steve pretty much says in the first three or four pages of the book Hey, Steve, I'm Steve, the you from the past. Uh, we really screwed up something here. Uh, and in order to fix it, I had to give away our memories. Uh, but I bought you like these really awesome magic items. Congratulations. Enjoy. You can now do what I couldn't achieve. And that's it. So present Steve really hates past Steve. And he's always looking out for future Steve. Like He's like, future Steve is so going to appreciate everything that I do for him um, because I go out of my way to make him happy, whereas past Steve was an a-hole. And I think that the truth is going to come out that past Steve was doing a heck of a lot more for present Steve than present Steve gives him credit for. So um, anyway... There's a lot of questions that are never answered, and that's fine. This is book one. You know it's going to be three books uh, before we get to the end of this this story. So no biggie. Uh, like I say, I can wait to book three to see if it's answered. If it's not, okay, we'll have another something will come up that will either be books four, five, and six, or we'll have the uh, mashup of all the known universes, and we'll see You know what happened where. Uh, but like I say, it's it, let me say, it doesn't make you feel like you are missing out on something. Uh, but it was, does rather smartly orchestrate and artfully tell you uh, enough so that you enjoy the story. Uh, I, I don't have an issue with it because, like I say, I know it's going to come out sooner or later. Um, Darren always does provide answers to certain things. So it's not like I'm going to lose my mind if I don't have that. Um, As for the naughty business, the book is full of it. Uh, Master Darren is pretty descriptive. It is fairly well fleshed out and very visual. The scenes fill the screen in the theater of your mind so that you're looking for some grown-up sassy time. You won't be disappointed. Um, Turning to the narration, what the hell can I say? We are talking about Andy P., Okay, and she can make her voice go from sexy to sultry in two seconds flat. So far, the only thing I don't think I've heard her do for a book like this is a screaming O. I'm sure it will happen someday. I'm sure it will. Uh, Andrea is a top-notch voice actress. Um, She has voices for characters and voices for the cousins of those characters, as well as their neighbors, and I bet she could even do a cat or a dog from those neighbors. Um... 
she would literally kill voicing cartoons and doing like mature animated movies. And I don't mean like adult mature you know, animated movies. I mean like anime or you know uh, cartoons made for adults, grown ups. You know that have more than like stupid jokes and punchlines. It's like it's not like Phineas and Ferb. I'm thinking like you know. Um, Young Justice or something along those lines. Um, go DC. If you're going to do something to Andrea, go DC uh, because they just kill with their animation uh, stuff. But if you ever decide to go that route, you, you would kill. I mean, you've just got the range that you can do voices uh, that's just scary good. Um, and, you know, she has some serious range. Uh, she plays all these ladies and Steve so well, so very well. You genuinely believe that she experiences the emotions that they do. I mean, I listen to it, and I think she is literally feeling uh, everything that this character is doing. And that's why I think there's when she says, I'm passing on doing this book, or I just can't do it because of the, the nature of what it's about. Like, like, I know she's not doing Fostering Faust. And it's got nothing to do with her and Randy Darren. It's got more to do with the fact that um, the stuff that goes on in Fostering Faust would probably... Uh, affect her in a way that she couldn't deal with it. Uh, because I think that she puts her heart and soul into these characters and she lives out what they are doing. I, I really believe that. And I could be wrong and she's just that good of an actress and she's like, oh, darling, please. You know, if you think that's how it is, then, then great. Um, but no, I mean, you can never go wrong listening to Andrea. Okay, I found this to be at least 8.4 stars. Uh, it's a great story, amazing narration. My only grievance, the only grievance was the quick way that the mayoral sisters took to Steve. I mean, Steve does some really bad stuff to them, their family, whatever you want to put it. And I think that they might have just been a little bit more resentful uh, for how he coerced them to joining him. Uh, because I, I'm just like, holy crap, he just did that. And then they're going to go ahead and get along with this. I would have been highly suspicious of their actions. I'd have been like, watch that, my God. Because there's no way, there's no way they're looking out for my interest. Um, but who knows? Um, other than that, this book was practically flawless. I, if, if it wasn't for that bit, I would have probably had to set an 8.6. Uh, that's how good this book was. I really enjoyed it. It's got town building and character building. And it's, I mean, it, it, it's got crunch. It's just got a whole lot going on that most books don't carry. And I, I really enjoyed this a lot. Uh, but yeah, I just, there was just one thing. It just didn't make sense to me. And I was just like, I have to take away a little bit here. I'm uh, at 8.4. It's still really good. It's amazing. Uh, Andrea Parsonow. I would listen to Andrea Parsonow read the phone book. Uh, just because, you know, get the phone book and just start reading it on this, uh, you know, discord sometime. I'll plug in and listen because you're just amazing, Andrea. Okay. Uh, so 8.4 stars. You're going to enjoy it. I know you will. Okay, so next up is Seductive Seas, books one through four. Uh, the Seductive Seas Little RPG series by Calico Jack. I don't think he's really the 1800s pirates, uh, pirate that sailed to sea with the ladies, but it might be him. He could be that old. I don't know. Um, narrated by Sierra Klein. Sounds familiar. Uh, with a book length of three hours and 59 minutes. Back on the island... Dietz felt the warm morning sun on his face and a gentle breeze against his skin. He even managed to detect a salty tang in the air. Closing his eyes, he could try to find something in his senses that told him this immersive world wasn't real. But at the moment, there was nothing. The only clue Dietz had that this was not real was the compass tattoo emblazoned on his forearm that both marked him as a player character and his method of exiting the game. It also ensured that players were less likely to get disoriented. Opening his eyes again, Dietz turned right and began to follow the shoreline. Treasure's always on the right. That's what one of his gaming buddies had always said growing up. Dietz supposed it was right by the virtue of the simple fact that if you hit a dead end and turned around, objectives and loot would then be on the right-hand side. So I'm going to give props where props are due. Um, too often, I have read a few of these books that deal with sex one way or another in which the author knows absolutely dick about the literary genre, like the, the horrible fantasy swap online by Alison Bell or the malignantly offensive ganged book I reviewed on this show. Um, it is obvious that those books were written as a, a right-to-market 
cash grab uh, by individuals who couldn't care less about the lit RPG community uh, because they obviously didn't invest one minute's worth of research into any game lit books to help the, with the writing of their stories. It, it, you don't have to like do tons of research. Read 10 or 12 of those books and you get an understanding of what lit RPG is, what the readers look for, what they want. And like I said before, I, I don't hold it against anybody. If you want to make money and rate the market and, and you do a good job, grand, fantastic. But those were not those cases. Um, Captain Calico Jack clearly has read a few of the books because he has a progression down in the gaming crunch in the right places. As I said before, he even comes up with a pretty slick trick for a harem or adult book uh, with chastity belts, the sort of thing uh, that requires certain tasks to be performed, i.e. questing or leveling, to get them unlocked. Um, thus, a salty dog could acquire a veritable bevy of bodacious buccaneer babes, but never get to indulge in unlawful carnal, carnal knowledge 100% of the way, if he's uh, he's failed to unlock any other safeguards. Um, I, I do believe that they allow for certain things to... I'm brushing my teeth. <laughs> certain things to happen, but um, down below there, that's a no-go show um, until you, you take those off. So I think it, that was like probably the my favorite thing about the series was the, the, the just a twist on the adult stuff, uh, saying that you actually have to do a little work in the game uh, and progress and do things uh, in order to earn earn the sex. Uh, as in Ganged, uh, where, where they, they say, okay, you've got to go out and you've got to rescue your boyfriend. Um, here, you know, you've got to get the ladies on your side, and then once you do that, then you got to figure out how to get that little lock undone. Um, so that was a pretty neat little thing. And I will say that the sex is salty and steamy, and the books definitely fulfill a need for pirate lit RPG. After a drunken night of watching Pirates on the Caribbean marathon, you might want to just grab this book and give it a listen. Um, Sierra Klein pulls off the sexy pretty well. Um, and made the dry beach sand feel a little wet and moist when she needed to. And I'm not talking about some ocean foam shooting across sandy toes. I, I think she plays the MC Dietz, the male lead, um, pretty well, in addition to the gamer gals and Dietz's boss. Uh, she certainly makes the sand steam and your toes curl. Uh, I, I think she did a really good job here. And I think before, uh, in my other book, um, she, she actually earned a point all unto herself just for, for the job that she did there. Here, it's the same thing. I think she does a really good job, uh, and, and she's rock solid across the board. I, I think that she handles the story pretty well. I, I'm actually impressed with her. Um, so, you know, like I say, she, she may not be like Annalise Rennie or Andrea Parsneau or Annie Ellicott or Lori Catherine Winkle, but um, she's got potential. She's got it there. My only real issue is that the real world romance doesn't quite compete with the in game stuff. Um, I always say that, you know, honestly, we get these books to read about the game world. Uh, there are very, very few books that I will say the real world is just as interesting as the game world. Very few times do I ever say, damn, I wish we spent more time outside of the game. Like Dave Wilmorth, you know, the land of the undying. Um, that story is just amazing because you're in the game and you're like, yes, this game is going amazing. And they get into the real world and you're like, holy crap, the real world is amazing. And, and then, you go to the game, you're like, I don't want to leave the real world. And you get to the game, you go, I don't want to leave the game. That kind of book right there. This is not that kind of a style of book. Um, because every time Dietz gets out of the game, I'm just kind of like, man, I'm just passing time until we get to the game again. Uh, I really could care less about his his romantic infatuation with his boss, uh, the trying to grow the relationship, any of that, that. That really, it just does not amaze or astound me um and i don't even say like with with charles dean and in, in his war eternus uh lee leaves the game world periodically even then i'm just as intrigued by what happens in the real world because he's been shot at and he's i mean there's a lot of stuff that happens there uh in addition to the stuff that happens in the gaming world uh so so i can take both of those and say wow this is really good but but here again, I, I just really just yeah. The story outside is not nearly as interesting or fun 
as the gaming stuff. And it kind of drags things down a bit as it moves forward. I was a little disappointed that despite the fact that we were in a book dealing with privateers, privates, and buccaneers, booties, and various other seamen, uh, we never once saw Dietz perform the angry pirate act on his boss in the real world. Uh, that would have been a great deal. Um, if you've never, ever, ever performed that during sex, you're missing out. And I'm just going to say, if you don't know what kind of a sex act an angry pirate is, I encourage you to look it up because it's unbelievably funny. Um, uh, but it's only something you would do to your lover once uh, because you probably wouldn't have the same lover twice. But it's funny. So if you're a guy like me that cherishes funny over everything else, because I do things just to be silly all the time. I really, I really do. I cherish the act of stupidity and fun and goofiness. Um, that would be something uh, that you might want to try. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into it. It's pretty graphic and it's it's, it's a little weird, but it's funny as all hell. Um, but let me just say that at the end of it, the woman's supposed to be swearing like a pirate uh, for what you do. Uh, so just let's just go that route and I'll, I'll say it like this. Um, if you do get this book, please just get the four book collection. Uh, book one was released as a single and my guess is it was just to test the waters no pun intended. Uh, and while the story is interesting and carries a lot of potential, it isn't worth one credit for that one book. There, it's not that long. I think it's like an hour in length, which is more than the rest of the books are. They're, they're a lot shorter just because you've got all these books crammed into this one package, but your, your time isn't equivalent to an hour per. Uh, but either way, um, you can get the collection for the same price as a, as a credit, and it's it's it's, it's worth it. Uh, this book clocks in one minute shy of four hours. So to me, it, it sort of feels like a half a book. Um, and again, that's up to you. I, I just read um, in this this review, the, the Super's X Heroes book three. And, um, you know, the first thing I said was, uh, I'm beginning to like books that are like nine, eight, seven, six, even five hours long um, because they can get the story in and I can read more stories and I can, I can have fun. Um, but you know, one minute shy of four hours is, is not a lot. Um, it's not a lot of book. And I, you know, I think that um, you have to really weigh out whether it's worth it to you or not just for the price, because you know, if you get a credit, uh, Credits aren't exactly cheap. You know, I think they're like $14 if you're in a gold club or something like I am with Audible. Uh, so you get like one credit a month. And I don't think I'd want to waste one credit on a four-hour book. Uh, but if you, you had a free credit laying around and you wanted to knock yourself out, get it. Um, so it's really up to you. Um, I, I, I just feel like there should be more content um, for what you're paying for, if you're going to pay for it. Um, but otherwise, i say it's a decent story. Uh, Sierra Klein does do a good job. I, I give her that. And the story is not bad. Um, and the sex is hot and, and, and it's, it's pretty graphic. So, you know, if you're asking me, is the sex sexy? I'm going to say, yes, it's, it's pretty much sexy and it's, it's all good to go. Um, but like I say, final score is 7.4 because the book is short. It feels like a half a book or a book in progress to some degree. Um, to me, it feels more like four short stories tied together rather than one solidly long book. Uh, the real world stuff stepped on my gaming toes. Uh, so I'll say that if, you know, Calico makes more, I'll be happy to give them a listen. But I'm going to wait until there's another collection. I'm not doing anything individually. Um, I think this is one of those things where they, they put out like a, a few thousand word story here and there and they put it on Kindle when they go by that. Um, or they just put it out for like your ebook for like 99 cents to make some money. Uh, but, you know, it's not bad. Dietz is a good gaming character. Uh, but the best part is this does not feel and very well could be um, a right to market book. But if it is, the author did his research enough that it, it feels okay uh, that, you know, he pulls it off where I don't go, can't stand this guy and it doesn't feel like gaming. Um, I think he, he at least did a little bit of research and did everything. It, but he the problem is, is I don't know who he is. Um, and that's just it. He just goes by Calico Jack. And like I said, I don't think he's a real pirate. You know, he was Calico Jack was hanged. So I don't think he survived unless he's really slick and smart and he escaped um, at some point in the past. Um, so this is somebody using his name. But, you know, uh, 
I don't know who he is. So I can't tell you if he's a part of the community, not a part of the community. Uh, it's kind of like the guy that did the Land of the Undying stuff. No idea who it is. I'm still trying to figure out who that is. I, I really don't know, and I'm curious about it. Uh, or the Land of Trademark Online, I should say, not the Land of the Undying. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, Dave Wilmarth. I know you wrote the Land of the Undying. Um, I meant to say the Land of Trademark Online uh, because I have no clue who wrote that. I really don't, and um, I'm curious. I would love to find out and just, just behind the scenes talk to him for a few minutes uh, just because, like I said, I haven't read the book. I can't say anything about the book. Uh but it's just one of those things that it intrigues me, and I'd like to get some answers on a couple questions uh, that I have just, just from hearing other people talk. Um, but, you know, that to me does not feel like a right to market. That feels like somebody who is an insider. They're a member of the Little RPG community family. Uh, whereas with Calico Jack, I can't tell you who they are or how deep they are ingrained. Uh, I just think he did a, a decent enough job that it's worth reading the story. Uh, and I think he has a, a cool... Uh, mechanic with the chastity belt sort of things uh so you know it's got potential but I, I just need a little bit more bang for my buck seriously um and, and that's not a a riff on you know the naughty special uh that's just the fact you, you need to get more you, you need more than you know four hours worth of stuff uh when it comes to a book and i get you got four four books there but it's not it's not a lot it's not it's not enough in some ways uh to take care of things um so either way uh i think it's 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 decent enough that i, I would give it a a 7.4 all right next up is fostering faust book two by randy darren i'm daring you to read this book it's that good uh -huh. narrated by stephanie savannah with a book length of 13 hours and 12 minutes Alex quirked a brow, then laughed to himself. It's almost as obvious as a sunrise where everything happened. Looking at the start of the financial report, he saw massive expenditures from himself. Then they suddenly stopped. This must be when I arrived here. Following that line, he could see where he'd made changes, pushed the economy in the right direction, and stopped his own spending. Riley, making our changes then watching the economy stabilize. A short while after that, he saw a massive increase in expenses. And this must be for the balls, meeting Carla and Valeria, then marrying Anna and Holly. Moving down the line, he saw another strange fluctuation, except this time it was a massive jump in military salaries. Yep, now, now here, here we go. Here's another Randy Darren book. It, can I help it? Can I help it if he cranks out masterpieces faster than Don Rickles could insults? No. So suck it up, pretty babies. We is going on a wild ride. First of all, Fostering Faust was a very polarizing novel. Book one, I just think people, I don't think people were prepared for the very nature and of the story and the fearlessness with which Darren went forward to create that story. Um, I know a lot of people who were kind of like shocked and put off by the content, which is fine. Clearly, that's why it's written by Randy Darren, because it is not going to be um, a nicey nice book. It's going to have really hard graphic content, content that is going to uh, disturb some people. And, and I have to say, Darren is very bold and uncompromising in his vision. Um, and, and I respected the hell out of that. Uh, well, things have not changed in book two. Book two is just as entrenched in the things that you either loved or hated about book one. He hasn't changed course. He he goes full bore ahead. Um, it reminds me of like um, the scene of Buckaroo Bonsai where they're going to try to go through matter and they have that mountain there and they have the car and they go through the very physical space of the mountain. That is what Darren feels like he's doing. He is going just a thousand miles an hour towards this big mountain. And it's either going to be, either way, it's going to be spectacular. Whatever happens at the end of this is going to be amazing. It's going to be worth the time and effort that you put into this series. Um, so this book is very graphic in nature. <laughs> I don't say that lightly. 
I do not say it lightly at all. This is most likely the hardest edge book on the show. I mean, if you want to talk about hard edge, this is like a straight razor made of adamantium. And if you know Marvel Comics and Wolverine, that is like talking about Wolverine's claws. Unbreakable, never-ending sharpness. Um, this is just it, this is not a book for people who are prudish or squeamish. Not even close. Uh, as there is both hardcore sex and hardcore deaths. Uh, Darren does some very significant world building here. Um, as our hero becomes embroiled in politics that he's better off avoiding, but he keeps getting sucked in. You know, it's kind of like from The Godfather. This is what I thought I was out. They pull me back in. Um, he fails to avoid it, and so he has to scheme and plot his way out of another fine mess after another fine mess. Alex is exactly the kind of character, and I'm going to say it like this, the kind of character that I absolutely love. He is a schemer and a manipulator. He's not a face him down kind of guy, okay? I far prefer string pullers to sword drawers any day of the week. Um, they're simply that I, something that I find fascinating, inherently in, just amazing, about a character who outwits their opponents continually. Like, my favorite gods are the tricksters, like Loki and Coyote and and so on and so forth, like, you know, Anisi. The, the, the characters who, who pull fast ones on other characters, uh, those are the ones who just really, really, they, they suck me right in. Like, my favorite character from Shakespeare, uh, and Charles Dean will tell you, we have arguments all the time because he has his, I have mine, and mine is Iago. Uh, I adore Iago. Iago is my character. William Shakespeare wrote Iago just for me. And he didn't realize it uh, because Yago. I would have literally. I would have posters of Yago up on my wall if we had. Po if you you could make a poster of Yago, I would have Yago up on my wall because the dude is so backhandedly sly and manipulative, and um, getting what he wants in spite of everything um, up until the end, of course. But Yago is like just just genius, and Alex lives for moments just like Iago does. Now, Iago has got a very different motivation than Alex, but Alex is such a manipulative bastard, you have to love him. Oh, he 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 toys with people. He breaks people. He he pushes boundaries that people don't realize that they have. Uh, he makes them do things that they didn't know they were capable of and don't want to do, but he makes it happen. He, he's just that good. Um, I love that and this is like like seriously that was what appealed to me in the first book was his character how he did things and i i remember you know how he he got out of the the, the jail cell that he was in when he first appeared in the new world after he made his deal and you know the one guy kind of boned him on his end and then you know graphically surprisingly karma struck and alex didn't flinch he was kind of like screw that dude he got what he deserved and and that's me, you know. If you if you you wrong me, uh, you're getting what you deserve at some point. Uh, you know, I, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day, online, and and you know she was saying how you know, revenge isn't as good as karma because you know karma is something you can sit back and watch, and I and I kind of said you know revenge and karma are the same thing. One's active mode, one's passive mode. But for me, revenge, the other thing I would say that revenge is best served cold. Well, it, it is. It, it's, it's best served cold when you are the most dispassionate because it tastes like strawberry ice cream with sprinkles served on a nice sugar cone. Oh. Whereas karma is kind of like warm tapioca pudding. Um, and that is the difference with, with characters. I am that guy. Alex is that guy. He will get his revenge for wrongs that are done to him. Um and so, you know, he, he is not a set back and wait for things to happen kind of dude. No, no. Um, the characters, most importantly, Alex, all do some series growing up in book two. And I must say that his first wife, um, and I can't think of her name, I'm sorry, um, but it, it's the one that she is always there for. She is quickly becoming one of my most favorite, cherished characters of Darren's. Um, she does everything. She is supportive um, of her husband in every single way. She's enthusiastic about it. She takes great pride in scoring, scoring souls for his bargain. 
she is like a diamond among cubic zirconia. Um, we do see a surprising twist with Alex and Leah and their contract take place in this book. But for me, the best part about this book came when Alex is kidnapped. And I'm not trying to give you spoilers, but he gets kidnapped. And that's when his machinations make Machiavelli look like Mortimer Snurd. Look him up, people. Look him up. It's more fun that way. Yeah. He makes Machiavelli look like that dude. Mortimer Snurd. This cat, Alex, is just sneaky, underhanded evil. Um, he is Yago squared or cubed or whatever you want to call it to whatever power, to the nth power, ninth power, tenth power. He, he really, really is just yeah, spot on in getting back and getting away from people. And I also cherish the way that Alex has earned the title of Count Inferno uh, and kept the legend growing after he got it. Whenever an opportunity arise, arose to allow him to do that, he, excuse me, he, uh, he, he took advantage of it. Uh, the ladies, they're all seductive and servile, but not to a point that's disturbing. Uh, their eagerness to please comes from a place of genuine emotions. Um, like I say, this book, it, it, it runs a gamut of things. Um, you know, he's struggling to stay away from one woman in power, and there's political things there. Uh, then there's another political battle, and he finds himself embroiled in things. So there's a lot of different things happening all at once. And he, he's struggling to keep, I, mean, I don't want to say struggling, because his, his um, lands and holdings are doing really well. But he's struggling to keep these other people from invading him and taking his stuff. And, and he's doing his best to redirect them into other places. Um, so I, I just think this book is really smart, and I, I just severely enjoyed the story. Um, it's really, really good. Uh, the narration by Stephanie Savannah stuns. Yes, I like alliteration, okay? Um, but she never hesitates and tackles serious material with vigor and enthusiasm. She makes you feel like everything that Alex does to his numbered and non-numbered alike is just is, is important and special. I mean, he, he does things, he's not malicious about it, but she, she makes you feel everything. Um, you run the, the range of emotions of, I can't believe he did that, to good for him, to holy crap, I can't believe she likes that sort of thing. Um, she certainly has the feel for feeling action and emotion in the right spots. And she keeps each character clearly defined. As juggling acts go, she is flipping live chainsaws and making them look like rubber balls. So, uh, you know, this was one of those books where I, I get really excited uh, I, I got this book and I just devoured it because Faust is probably one of my favorite books uh, that, that Randy Darren or William Moran has done. Uh, and this has not been a disappointment. It has just maintained the high octane level uh, and the, the manipulations and the deceitfulness and the backstabby stuff. Uh, it's just it's just above board. It, it's just so awesome to see him handle these things. And I, I just have to say... The fact that Alex has the patience to remain where he is to scheme to kill somebody and do it in a very difficult way, but to make sure it happens and comes to fruition was just so satisfying. Um, I, I really, I, I hate to sound like this. I see a lot of myself in the dude. I mean, there's just certain people that I, I connect with as characters um, and I, I could see myself doing that. My son literally said something along those lines the other day about a character on a TV show. I, I, I was just, not even paying attention and, and I didn't feel kinship, but he's like, I totally see you doing that dad. And after he said that, I was like, yeah, he's totally right. That is exactly probably how I would have handled things. So in this case, you know, I, I feel kinship with, uh, the character of Alex. And, and so I, I, I do enjoy the book. Um, but this book, I have to say the sex is very graphic. Um, Darren is not known to hold back. And, you will will see some scenes that you're like, holy crap, I can't believe he did this. Um, because he, he does it. He, that's just the way it is. Um, my final score, uh, this book. Oh, this book. This book pushes boundaries, buttons, boobies, and still tells a clear and entertaining story. Believe me, the book has the potential to become super dark, but somehow it maintains a balanced perspective. 
with great characters, a cool setting, and nubile narration. Eight and a half stars. 8.5. It's that good. And if you like book one, get it. If you, you haven't read it yet, get it. But this book is, I think it's better than book one because we've already got the characters from book one and now we're seeing them grow a little bit. We don't have to do introductions and so on and so forth. Now he, he's got them established and we can play with them more. So it's really good that way. All right, up next is Picking Up the Pieces, Enthralled series. The Enthralled series. This is book two, written by Prax Venter, narrated by Christian Fox, with a book length of 10 hours and one solitary minute thereafter. Sasha will pay for what she has done. Mark and his three enthralled, Anix, Vale, and Rue, looked out over the desolate crater that used to be Oxuma Village. He wanted to just start running directly towards the monster responsible for destroying these people. He had been looking forward to seeing this beaten-down group of good people grow and prosper. Now, Donovan, his wife, their asshole son, all of them, were gone. You said we had to fix the broken heart first, right? Rue said softly behind him. Mark turned to face the velvet girl and sighed. I don't know if we have to. It seemed like the right thing to do. I figured we would run into the holes they created on the way. Which way does the compass point, Mark? So, now here's the deal. I, I want to start off by apologizing to Prax uh, for me taking so long to get to this. Um, you know, I, I, I'd gotten this, and, and it's been a while since I was able to get to it. I really wanted to review it a while ago. Uh, and then things happened in my life that have kind of slowed me down a little bit. Uh, and then after I kind of got away from that and I'm starting to get a little bit better, I wanted to save it for this episode of the show, which I really wanted to do this like probably four or five weeks back this episode. Um, so I'm really behind on this. So my apologies. Uh, now the last time he, he also gave me some flack. So I'm, I'm going to cut myself a little bit of slack because he, he gave me some flack for misspelling the names of the ladies in his book, in my review. I guess he went and read my review on like his, his, his book page or something. And he's like, you didn't spell a single one of their names correctly. Well, I mean, you know, first, thanks for actually reading your review. I, I appreciate that. Secondly, I work in audible format, so I took a shot. I took a shot and I did it all phonetically, or at least how I would have thought the book was, you know, supposed to be written or the names were supposed to be pronounced. And you have to cut slack sometimes. You just have to. Uh, so I'm not even going to put their names down this time at all. <laughs> I'm just going to skip that portion of the, the, the review so I don't screw up anything else and look more stupid than I actually am. Um, I really liked the first book. Uh, it had one of the best time compression uses I've seen in lit RPG. And I thought it was smartly done. Also, having the main character kind of wake up in the middle of a Groundhog Day style replay was neatly done too. I mean, you know, he, he hadn't realized he'd lived out that same day over and over and over again. So many, you know, just thousands of times um, until he'd already done it for thousands and thousands of times. So after the first book was done, <clears throat> I was expecting some big stuff. And man, Prax did not let me down. I think book two is an improvement uh, and that it shows um, some great development. Uh, the characters get a chance to grow and come into their own. I also think that Venter streamlined his writing style as nothing feels like it doesn't belong. Everything is there for a purpose, some significance, or deeper meaning. And I'm not saying you'll get like his existential crisis um, from reading the book, only that his writing has improved and it stays on point throughout. It's very consistent. Um, you don't have, you know, him going far in a field. You know, of course, he, he remains right on point the entire time. And and, and that was good uh, because you can just tell he's improved a hell of a lot. Um, in fact, the writing of this book really makes me want to read some other stuff of his now. Uh, not that I didn't want to read the, this book before book one, um, but I now I'm like, I can see where Venter is getting better and better. And it makes me more excited as a reader, uh, as a listener, because, you know, once a writer really starts getting into their groove, not only is it fun to see, it's fun to see them growing and, and developing and changing and, and, and having so much happen, 
but also, uh, it just makes for a good story. So, you know, um, I just really, really can't wait to see some of the other stuff he has coming out because this is like book two. And I know there's other books in the series and the series should be getting ready to get completed, I think. But he also has like a Reverend Jack coming out of SBT. Uh, so I look forward to that like immensely. I, I, I so, so badly look forward to that. Um, just because it's exciting to hear him have an opportunity to do something else. Uh, not that I'm not excited about this. This is good. This is really good. So, um, here's the point. How naughty is it? Well, well, we, we get frequent and descriptive sex acts, uh, but the sex breaks don't detract from the stories. It never came across like it does in some books. Like I say, sometimes it's like, oh man, we just barely escaped from that dragon. Let's do it. You know, um, it wasn't like that. Um, I'll give you an example of improper time for sex. Okay. I, I had listened to a book, an audio book called The Last Colossus, which is about some people trying to survive a megalodon attack. Uh, now, megalodons are the great big giant sharks, and you see a couple of those um, movies now, like Meg comes out and things like that, and they they, they kind of make the sharks like these huge monsters because they were beasts. They were massive. Um, but in the book, the, the, the two characters, like, get off of a boat out of the water and get on this island that has this volcano erupting. And as lava is, like, I don't want to call it flowing because lava kind of just kind of trundles along. It takes it a while to get where it's going. But as lava is just kind of going around them and going where it's going to go, they decide to have sex. But let me tell you, uh, I've been escaping from a, a vicious, giant, man-eating shark. Barely make it to an island. A volcano erupts. I, I think, as a man, yeah, I could probably look at the lady that I'm with and say, look, we're done. Why don't we bone and just have like 10 minutes of whatever? And I could see that happening, but I don't see that happening. I think that you're going to be exhausted. You're going to be tired. You're going to be filthy. Um, she's not going to be into it. Like, just, just for a clue, man, most times when ladies are, uh, let me say, how do I put this gently? When they're, they're running for their lives, they really don't feel like having sex. They just don't. Um, and so, you know, sex scenes are all about timing. And that was poor writing on, poor planning on the writer's part. Michael Hart, Michael Hodges, that's who wrote that story. Uh, Venter does not have that issue. Uh, as the sex scenes feel very natural and they fit into the story. Uh, you know, I don't hear, you know, it's not like arrows were flying by. And, uh, you know, he took, you know, his his novel lady and, and did this or that. None of that stuff happens, you know, uh, in that capacity. There's, there's points to when they have sex, why they have sex, so on and so forth. So to avoid spoilers, I will say that the ladies make some discoveries about themselves that makes them not too happy in the book. Uh, they might realize their, their very nature is not what they thought. Um, Although I suspect there may actually be like a real world resolution coming because the, 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 the discoveries that they make have a lot of implications on future stuff. And, and, and I, I think they're, the real world could have a way to resolve some of the issues. Uh, I don't want to come into it and give spoilers. So I'm going to just stay away from that. Um, but I think book three, or I don't know if they go into book four, if we've gotten that far yet, but I think that that's where we'll get some answers on like what can be done for the women and how, you know, they can be helped and what can, you know, so the story's progressing. I mean, it's progressing quite nicely and I just can't wait to see where it goes. Uh, although I do want to get a copy of like the, the audio for Reverend Jack, uh, just because like I say, Venter's really impressing me with his writing style and what he does. Fox, Fox does a pretty good job on narration and I won't, let me see how do I put this. I won't complain about pronunciation of areolas this time around. I, I'm going to just skip by that and just say um, he's one of the few men I've heard narrate a naughty scene that didn't make me just a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, like I say, Justin Thomas James is probably the only other guy I've heard uh, that he, he's just like Rico Suave with his voice. And you don't really, really notice it. Um, but I think that Fox does it too, where he can tell the story and I'm not going to 
it's a little creepy hearing the guy talk about doing this and that and the other thing. Um, because unless it's my voice in my head uh, recounting events that are going on, it doesn't seem quite as fun and exciting because it sounds like it's my best friend uh, recounting his his orgy from down the street 10 nights ago. Uh, I really couldn't care less about what he did. So, <laughs> uh, you know, but it never stopped him from telling me those stories. Um, anyway, uh, you know, so, so Fox does does do that because like I said I've heard have my naughty bits read to me by a lady if possible but otherwise it's it's a lot like me reading a penthouse letter to myself out loud Uh, it just doesn't turn me on but but Fox does a pretty good job and I I was able to handle it quite well Um, I think that Venter really has gotten a good grasp here, uh, and I think he's moving forward uh, in a very good direction. Uh, and I think that uh, the revelations are enough to say, "Hell yeah, I'll come back and find out what happens next." Uh, so you know, I think it's a it's a pretty solid story. Uh, characters have grown, stories changed, and shown improvement. Uh, I like where the tale is going. So I'm going to say final score is eight point three stars. It's it's really worth it. Um, I just, I, I, I really want to see what happens next. And that is how I know it's a good story. Uh, because I, I have my phone and I will listen to a book whenever I get a chance. Like I'll click it on and boom, I'll have a story on there. And if I have a story on there and it's been six hours and I haven't tried to listen to it even for a little bit, like if I'm just sitting here and it's like, do, 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 I've got other things I'm doing and I'm not listening to a story. I know that story is not that great. Um, and those are the ones I try to, to either not review or tear down. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is this is one of those stories where I was, okay, uh, I've got a few seconds here. I'll listen for three minutes uh, while I'm on hold on the phone. Or I'll listen. I'll put the phone in my pocket while I'm parking cars for, you know, for, for the funeral. And I'll listen until somebody comes and then I'll shut it off. And, and I do that. Um and this is this is one of those cases where that's exactly how I did things. Uh, so, you know, like I, said, I knew I enjoyed it. And it's a good book. It's a good story. And I think you'll really like it a lot. So give it a listen. Okay. Next up, we have Enhancer 2 by Wyatt Kane, narrated by Chris Graves, with a book length of seven hours. Ty Wilcox was sitting at the main bar in the Concubine Club with the rest of the staff occupying other stools or standing around him. For once, the ceaseless pseudo-music that typically thudded through the club was nowhere to be heard. It was still fairly dark, but at least there weren't any flickering strobes and dancing lasers. The club was half an hour from opening, and even though he'd had to come early, it was still Ty's favorite way to experience it. Although favorite might have been overstating things. Ty didn't like the noise, the cloying, the rank smell of exhaled alcohol, or the way the soles of his shoes stuck to the floor. Yet without the perpetual noise and strobes, the place was at least tolerable, even though Angie the Hutt was addressing all of the staff as if she despised every last one of them. Honestly, I don't know how any of you expect to keep working here, the grotesque woman said from the center of the floor. So you may remember me reviewing Enhancer some time ago. It was a decent book, and it received a score, I think, about 7.3, if I remember correctly. Um, I think the writing has improved, and the story is tighter and more streamlined. And I like the introduction of what looked to be uh, a fourth possible member coming to the burgeoning harem. And I count the guy, and and there's two ladies and and him. Um, But there may be a fourth member coming uh, to join the gang in the future. Um, Kane very clearly builds upon book one in every single way that counts. I think that he uh, has could have fleshed out his characters a bit more and expound on the romance attraction with the first two girls. Uh, I'm not sure saying that I'm not saying that like you know it's one dimensional, but like the Angie the Hutt character is more of a caricature than anything else. Uh, but she's just an example, and in fact, um, she's one of those characters where I. I, I get where she was at in book one. Why they we're still there with her in book two, I don't know. I would have either, uh, I would have used like some sort of technological powers and, and done something to her, or I would have walked away at this point because uh, clearly he can make more money doing anything else with his powers than working for Angie. Uh, but I get that Angie's a, a character that you don't want to just pass up because she's 
just that malicious and evil and people hate her. It's kind of like uh, Dor- is it Dolores? Dolores Umbridge from the Harry Potter stuff. Um, so she's like she's a, she reminds me of that character a lot. Um, but I think all of them could have been built up a little bit more. But I will say that they are more realistic around this time around. And I'm a little bit more forgiving of details. Just because a female deer doesn't have antlers doesn't mean that they can't have antlers modified onto a, somebody who wants to look like a deer if they want them. So, you know, I, I think I was a little bit more picky back then about things. I was a little bit too strict. On, like, I know I, I, I say this all the time. I, I really, like Daniel Shanofen, I really hit him hard on a couple things um, because, as you said, it didn't fit or it was incorrect um, scientifically. And like this, I, one of my biggest peeves was was that one of the girls uh, was a deer modified woman, and she had horns or antlers, I should say. And you know, females don't have antlers; they they don't have them. And so I was kind of like, yeah, well, let's do, do some research because that just that, that drives me crazy. And I want to say this. I do mean do some research. When you go to a book, always research it. If you, if you research it and you get it wrong, then at least you tried. Um, but, you know, here I, I'm going to just say I get it um, and I'll let it go. If she wanted horns or antlers or whatever she would call them, um, you know, like I say, they're antlers. They're for a deer. But um if, if she wanted the antlers, I'm sure they would have put them on her, and they wouldn't have said, well, you know, female deer in the wild don't have antlers deer. It's only the males. The males grow them. They grow their racks, and then blah, blah, blah. That wouldn't have happened. They'd have put them on her. So um, I'm a little bit more lenient this time around on this sort of stuff. Um, but that leads me into some of the more interesting parts of the book, um, which would be like the world itself. Uh, here you have a world that can upgrade regular humans um, just cosmetically. Um to a certain extent, I mean, like I said, a lot of the changes that you have with the deer woman, they're just cosmetic. She doesn't gain, like, um, magical deer powers from having antlers grown onto her head, grafted to her skull. Um, I mean, she has antlers grafted to her skull, but, um, you know, what, what's she going to do with them? Uh, you know, as long as she gets anything from that. The world is a secondary character, and it's as alive as the other characters by a whole lot of means. There's a lot going on here, and we get a pretty good taste of what's going on in the world now. Um, I always say that every superpower has been thought of, and it's more of how you employ your powers in a story that makes them cool. And Kane does manage to make his heroes and villains fun with their abilities. And I could see them all in action. Like, in my head, I could see them playing things out. Uh, so this time around, I, I, like I said, I'm a little bit more lenient with things, and I, I think that... We, we get a bit more of a taste for what the world is and what it's like out there. And like I say, that's a character all unto itself. And and the other characters, they they, they come off a little bit more awesome with their powers. Um, the book pretty much picks up where the first one left off. Um, Ty is oddly, like I said, still working a crappy job and struggling to reconcile his life as a hero with his life as a normie. Uh, when all of a sudden uh, a teleporting demoness character called Lilith shows up and throws his life into utter hell and chaos. Can he trust her? Should he? How will he tell the other girls? These are all things that he has going on. You know, is she lying? Is she not? Is, is she telling the truth? What does it mean? Um, Chris Graves, you know, he, he narrates the story and he elevates it. His narration is on fleek, whatever that means. Uh, he plays Angie the Hutt to perfection and gets inside of Ty's head. Now, Ty is the MC. If I didn't mention that, I think I just kind of jumped in. It was like, oh, and Ty does this. Ty's oddly working some crappy job. But Ty is the MC, the main character of the story. And I always appreciate how Graves does his work. And I know that if he's narrating a story, the story's going to be better for it. Uh, because Graves gives it all, and, and he really knows how to tell a tale. Um, so I enjoy that. Um, but I'm going to back up a little bit and just talk about Ty. Ty has um, relationships with two women on his team, um, which are the only other people on his team. But he, he's got relationships with them. And, and again, there it's a little bit more fleshed out, but I think that we could see more things happening in the future. I, I think that book three, we could get a lot more out of it. Um, and, and so I think that what we need to see is a lot more of what goes on in the world. You know, what are the, the cosmetic implants and enhancements? What are the 
cybernetic implants and enhancements that you can get. Like, why wouldn't everybody have all this? What, what goes on? Those are things that I'd like to see kind of come up from the background and play more into this as we go on. Um, because I think that uh, there's a lot of things happening in that world that we need to see uh, because it adds a lot more flavor and spice. Um, so here's the part where you're supposed to ask me about the naughty business. After all, isn't this the naughty show? You know, isn't it? Um, you know, so I'm, I'm going to say um, it is nice to have representation of sexy hotness without going into the penthouse or hustler territory. Um, the, the sex is good, um, but it's not like so extreme that you're kind of like, oh, I can't listen to this. If my mom walks in right now, it's 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 there but it's not like crazy crazy sex it's kind of more like uh like cinemax or show show showtime sex there's those showtime movies um where it just kind of shows a little bit here there uh you, you don't have like for example uh ty performing a naughty pirate on one of the girls uh so you, you know there's that or, or not, a, not a naughty pirate. The angry pirate. Why do I do that? And he doesn't perform an angry dragon on him either. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, I will say that this was an enjoyable book. I think the book has improved a lot since the first time around. Uh, I do see a lot of changes and improvements. So I'm going to say that if it was 7.3 before, we're at 7.9 stars. I, I, I think that... Uh, the book is, is pretty close to cracking, like really, really getting great. Uh, it, it could, it, it could get, get there. Uh, there's a few things that needs to get tinkered with a little bit. Um, and I think that for a harem, uh, add them in. You need to add any, at least a character a book for something like this. Uh, so there's never a question, you know, I, don't introduce them here and then go to there. Just, just add them in as you go. Um, so 7.9 stars, lots of changes for the better. Uh, and if if they were changes, they were additions that book one missed that it needed. Um, you know, so so things that you needed in book one, you get them now. You get them now. And, and you'll appreciate it. All right. 7.9 stars. Dear Penthouse. First... I would like to thank you for being there for me in my formative years, from ages of 10 to 35. You taught me so very, very much, and I deeply appreciate it. However, I have to say, I do not like the way that what seems to be one of your letter writers who is not me, has tried to pull a quickie on the lit RPG community. While I have to admit that locks... Oh, sorry guys. Um, you caught me and somehow this thing kicks on when I least expect it. Um, let me just put this away for the moment. Um, I'm going to move this back over so I can talk to y'all. Okay, um, I'm going to be reviewing a book called Ganged, but not Conquered. The full lit RPG reverse harem series. Really? Is it really now? I don't think so. Which is the online bimbo bundle books one through five. Yes, you not only get book one, but you also get five. That's right. Five for the price of dumb. That's right. The price of dumb. Uh, by Kira Locke, narrated by Sierra Klein, and a book length of 4 hours and 28 minutes. So you get five books that runs less than five hours. You don't even get a full hour per book. <sighs> when I saw the ad for the new immersive virtual reality role-playing game, I ordered one right away. The screenshots and videos of the gameplay intrigued me. In Lovescape's game world, I could be whoever I wanted to be. Most of all, I could stop being me, at least for a little while. 
my boring existence of working my miserably boring administrative job at a law firm, and my limited social life could all be left behind for a few hours every day. That's at least how the game was advertised. Become the babe you've always wanted to be. I'd always wanted to be beautiful. I'd always wanted a boyfriend. The game, Lovescape, promised me I could get all of those things from the comfort of my own home. Okay, so here's the deal. I have to admit right up front, Lost Tale is filled with graphic sex scenes that is both detailed and sensual. I do not like the clear and obvious attempt that this right-to-market that Locke is doing right now. That's what it is. I think that Locke is a sex writer who saw an opportunity to get into a new market and took a shot. Okay, um, Locke has absolutely no idea what Lit RPG stands for. None. She doesn't know that it means light, regular, public. Um, well, that's not right. Um, it's long, intelligent. I, I, you know what? She doesn't have to know what Lit RPG stands for, but she can't write it. Okay? She has no idea. None of what it is about. Not a freaking inkling. She attempts to fool dedicated readers, such as myself, by using gaming terms to an abysmal effect. Yes, yes, she, she throws in gaming terms. Her fight scenes are utterly cringe-worthy. Utterly cringe-worthy. And display the truth that she has never, ever put a video game controller in her hand or played a game or been in a game fight or a real fight in her life. I can't say the same for the sex parts because there has to be more to a book, even a harem book, than just sex. Clearly, she at least has watched a porno or has experienced sex. I, I will give her that. I have no problem saying, yeah, yeah, Locke has probably had sex. Has she had it the way that she describes? I sincerely doubt it. I sincerely doubt it. But she knows what sex is about, and she is very good at describing the sexy stuff. So, I'm not going to take any points off for the naughtiness that she puts in there. It, it is actually, if you want to just read a book for sex, uh, it's right here, not down here. It, it, yep, it's right, it's it, straight up and down. Because her stuff is, um, what, what's, um, um, those, those creatures... They they have these these horns, and then the thing on your leg it's it's a, a, a patella no it's a knee horn and knee um, they make you 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 get the idea okay um, but no one no one in the world just skips all the build up scenes in a porno movie and just watches the sex nobody does that I mean seriously who would do that nobody. No, but you have to watch to find out what leads to, um, you know, things happening. I mean, you need to know the characters and what drives them and why they call up the lonely pizza guy when they have no money. You have to know those things. And then you have to find out, will he accept certain things in lieu of money? Will he do certain things and, and give them money? I don't know. You have to watch everything. You can't just skip to the sex. Now, I'm jesting right here because I'm really not happy with this book, okay? First off, it, it was outside of my comfort zone because this is a reverse harem. Everybody talks about reverse harems. You know, what's it called when you get a, a single woman and a bunch of guys? Well, is, is that a harem or is it a reverse harem? Because a harem is one dude with a bunch of chicks, a bunch of women, a bunch of ladies. Well, you know, the ladies. Um, but anyway, um, that's what a harem is. So this was like one of those books I said, look, I hear about this all the time on, on the boards, you know, on Facebook. You go there and they talk about reverse harems and what works and what doesn't. So I see this and I say, okay, I have to try this. Even though it's not going to be something I really want to hear because it's not my bag. It's not my bag, baby. Um, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to open my mind to a whole new world like Doug Henning and, and, and see exactly um, what this writer comes up with. And, you know, 
how do I put this? The story, the story is about a a a, a frumpy, frumpy girl who just cannot get a date in real life, uh, and so she turns to virtual reality in order to find herself a boyfriend. Even if he's electronic, she's that desperate. She would rather have a virtual man than no man at all. And so she joins this game, and she ends up having to train. There's like a whole thing like she has to go out and do this, this, and this before she's even allowed to go into the game to play and have her sexy sex um, because that's what she wants. Um, but she has to train and then rescue. She, and then she has to rescue her first boyfriend. They've never met, but he's going to be her boyfriend. All he has, all she has to do is rescue her. It's kind of like the prince in Sleeping Beauty. You know, dude's scamming around the, 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 the forest, sees some chick taking a nap. He figures, hey, man, if I give her a smooch, she's going to really appreciate that and wake up and be really thankful. We're going to get married and have kids. You know, so it's the same thing. She's like, well, I'm going to go fight this evil, evil chick, and I'm going to kill her, and then he's going to see me kill her, and I'll break her spell over him, and he'll fall into my arms, and he'll do things to me. Uh, and that's the whole story. Now, there are a couple of things that I have to say disturb me. And, and, and again, porn stash, porn stash. I have to say my porn stash. I'm going to channel this now. There are certain things that are disturbing, even in a porno-style book, okay, um, that just should not occur. The MC is a virgin who is pretty insecure about herself and having her first casual sex. She really almost backs out of it, but before she can say anything, things happen and things are inserted into her. Uh, uh, without her knowledge, it happens. Uh, I don't want to say without her knowledge, but she's standing there naked and some dude just kind of comes up and is like, Boop, there you go, baby. I'm breaking in so you ain't a virgin and you can go take out your man. Um, the game decides to break her in and it happens really quick with an NPC who pretty much forcibly performs a three-way on her. Now, honestly, this was like one hair away from straight-up rape to me, um, but I never got the whole 500 Shades of Gravy, okay? I never understood that, the 50 Shades of Gravy or whatever it was um, that all the ladies read and, and loved. So what do I know? I mean, you know, if, if they can read that and they're okay with the stuff that happens there, then maybe that's fine. And like I said, this is a female writer, so I'm going to take it as she knows what ladies want. To me, it was a little disturbing. Even as I listened to it, um, I was like, holy hell, I can't believe that they went that route. But it was off putting. But I trundled along anyway. And the book never got better. It is basically just one sex scene after sex scene with barely recognizable game mechanics spread throughout. For example, she'll be in a fight and she'll say, and then I realized I was at 35% health. Well, hell, I never heard you got hit. I never heard anything. You're just suddenly fighting. You're 35% health or this happens and now you're down to 12% and you're about to die or whatever. What? Really? Where does that come from? There is no, none, no lit RPG in this book that even comes close to feeling like she knows what the hell she's talking about. If you want to talk about BJ's, you got it. She knows it. You want to talk about going in the back door? She can do it. Um, what's that spit roasty stuff? That's there. You can count on her, Miss Locke, to tell you all about those grand and wonderful things. Everything else, if it's game related in any way, forget about it. Forget it. It's like, like my five-year-old trying to describe what happens in a video game. When he plays Minecraft and he's talking to me about Minecraft, I don't have a damn clue what he's talking about because nothing he says makes sense. It's gibberish. And let me tell you, whatever my five-year-old, oh, he's six now, he just had a birthday. Whatever my six-year-old tells me about Minecraft is like Einstein describing the theory of relativity to me compared to Locke telling me about the RPG. She has no friggin' clue what she's doing with it. This is just one of those um, things where it's an obvious, obvious, obvious right to market. And again, I will say this. If somebody does a right to market book and they do it well, I don't care. If it's a good book, I don't care. 
I will accept it. I don't care if Stephen King, who I really am not a big fan of, if Stephen King wrote a lit RPG book just to make money, he said, hey, I'm Stephen freaking King. I can write a lit RPG book and make buku dollars off those guys over in the lit RPG community. Here's my stuff. If he does it and it's decent, damn, I'll say I hate Stephen King. This is clearly a right-to-market book. <coughs> Excuse me. But the book is good. I'll be happy to tout it. I will tout. Tout, tout, tout. The whole thing. No. This is a right-to-market. Locke has numerous novels that deal with getting ganged by aliens and orcs and tentacle monsters. Um, and now she just kind of found a new game genre to play in. So if you look at her about the author on Amazon, you would see. This is what it says. Author Kira Locke writes about women who explore love and sex with a variety of creatures. Orcs, aliens, tentacled and non-tentacled. Sorry, I missed the non-tentacled. Shifters and mermen. Most of the time, the women find themselves in group situations because sharing is caring. The more the merrier. And insert trait phrase that serves as a euphemism for orgies. So she pretty much just writes whatever the hell she thinks will sell, even if she has no idea what the subject is really about. I mean, it can't be hard to write about aliens with tentacles or non-tentacles, shifters, mermen, orcs, so on. That's easy. It's all fantasy. It's all made up. There are no real guidelines to those things. There's none. None of those things require anything other than imagination. Imagination. Okay? Those things are all fair game. But with lit RPG, it's too freaking specific. Okay? Too freaking specific. And this makes me go back to a time that I was talking about, like, Fantasy Swap, um, which was just another, and I realize this now, the reason why it was so bad was because it was a right-to-market book. It was someone who didn't have a clue about gaming, and they were talking about stuff in the book that, that made no damn sense, and it, it was a horrible, horrible story. And again, it was another book I took that goes outside of my comfort level, but I still tried it just to see what it was about, if it was decent, because I have to tell you guys if it's good or not. And if you remember the fantasy swap book, it's where a guy goes in and he gets stuck in a woman's body and he lives out all these fantasies as a woman that he never would have explored as a man. Now, you take it for what it's worth. It was not a good book. And I'm not saying it was a bad book because of the subject. I'm saying it was a bad book because it was crappily written. It was a horrible story. It was a horrible character and it had absolutely no concept of anything dealing with lit RPG. This tops it. It tops it. The only good thing is it doesn't have freaking J.J. Janess doing the narration. So I will say that Sierra Klein does a decent job on the narration. She doesn't hold back and tears right into the story. She gives it a lot of vim and vigor and verve. I would say that she chews up the scenery, but that might be a bit of a painful prospect considering what most of the scenery that's getting chewed is. I really have nothing negative to say about her, and I will probably be adding a point at the end just for her work alone because she does a pretty good job. But I go back to Kira Locke. <coughs> See, I'm getting, getting loud and I'm getting really irritated now. Excuse me. So, that's better. Um, she can talk about aliens and, and zombies and tentacles and merpeople and shifters. But pretty much, she writes whatever she thinks will sell. And that's it. She has no real idea of what the subject is really about. I'll bet her mermen even have blowholes. I'm going to back away from that for a second. So here's the deal. The book, if you're looking for straight up sex with a woman in a reverse harem, and that's all you want, this is a good book for you. It really is. Um, because if you just take it for that, it, it has a main character who has a harem of men. Um, I'll call them a sherem. There's a sherem. So it's she has a harem. It's a sherem. Um, there's a bunch of guys. 
She gains them one at a time, maybe two at a time, but she builds up a little harem air, and her sherem is strong, and they have sex, and this naughtiness abounding. And then there's there's this other stuff that kind of clicks in around that that has to deal with the idiotic game mechanic stuff that she has no idea what she's talking about. So, I mean, I guess you could do what most people do in porn and, and skip all the, the other stuff and go right to the scenes because that will work. It's kind of like, it, it, uh, it makes me laugh when like Ramon will say, well, there's, there's, there's a naughty stuff and I usually just skip that and go to the next thing. And I always chuckle. I was like, well, I get you don't like that. And no one makes you have to read it. But this is the exact opposite. Ramon would probably just skip the entire book because the gaming stuff sucks. And I'm not being facetious or even being funny at that. I mean, it blows. Okay, I got to get out of this, this mindset. Um, it really is horrible. The gaming stuff is horrible. Horrible. And then there's the sex stuff that he doesn't need to read. He doesn't want to read it. So he would say, I'm not going to read this stuff. He's going to skip that. So Ramon would probably go um, flip and look at the book and it's page one and go to the page, whatever it was, the last page of the book and be like, that was a really crappy book. But at least I didn't have to burn out my eyes doing this. I had to listen to it for what seemed like hours and hours and hours even though the narrator was pretty good. I'm going to just put that out there. Um, usually, in a case like this, the narration, the narrator sucks just as bad as the story because they're just doing something cheap. They put it out, they get a, get a person to come up and narrate, and they get it through real quick, and they, they put the product out and they run with it. The narrator is actually pretty pretty good. Sierra Klein, I, I would just wish that she would get out of this kind of junky, slocky stuff because it's just schlock, and it, it's below her, it's beneath her, and I think that she could do some amazing things uh, outside of this 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 field that she's in right now um, with the, the sex stuff. Um, but if she likes it, she likes it. But I think she could do a lot more. I really do. Um, but anyway, my final score, if you can't tell, I'm going to just say there's a story, there's characters, that's one and two points. Um the characters aren't brain dead, so you give it that. But the narration was good. So I'm going to say three points. This is a three-star book. That's three out of ten, not three out of five. Technically, I could almost tell you it's a three out of twenty. And I still would not make it as significant as I feel. Um, the book, like I said, it has redeeming stuff. If you want to just read the sex, it's right there. But for me, the fact that they, they tried to sneak this in under the radar and make it something that it's not pisses me off to no end. It's horrible. So as Count Olaf would say at the beginning of um, a series of unfortunate events, look away, look away. Because if you are looking for a naughty book with little RPG roots, this has all the spice but lacks the beef. Give it up. Give it a good, hard skip. Give it a flip and bid it adieu. Because this is... Not even a trashy romance novel. This is just a trash novel. 100% down the line. It's all crap. It's junk. And it should not be listened to. But don't listen to me. Don't take my word for it. You spend your money on a five books that can't come to five hours worth of stuff. And give it a shot if you really want to see what a share is. And I, I'm going to term that right now. I'm going to coin that term right now. I'm... I'm going to trademark it. A sherem is a she harem. A sherem. That's right. So, if you want to see a sherem, this is where it starts. But if you want to see a good book, just pass this sucker up. Just go do something else. Take up ski ball You'll meet more chicks doing that than you will read in this book. I'll tell you that. Ladies, you'll pick up more dudes playing ski ball than you will reading this book. Oh, oh, you're gonna be so. Oh, oh. oh hello. <laughs> I forgot I was recording. I was just <laughs> polishing up my little clown horn. <laughs> That's right. You know why? You know why I look like this right now? Because I have a very awesome story to tell you. You won't believe this, but it's true. It's an awesome story. 
It, it is. It's awesome. So, what I want to tell you right now is about Digital Hearts. Late Night Ambitions by Eden Red, narrated by Annalise Rennie, with a book length of 7 hours and 27 minutes. The bottom of the shirt hung out, and he approved of the relaxed style, even if it was something he would never do in other games. Trying to hold back his military sense of style, he moved on to pick simple black jeans and nice black leather shoes. Very nice, Susan said robotically. Morgan wondered if she said that to everyone, no matter what choice they made. Ignoring the tutorial avatar, the player looked through the extra accessories. Deep down, he felt like something was missing, something that would make his avatar at least a little more interesting. Scrolling through jewelry and tattoos, he came across a dragon tattoo. Heart beating a little faster, he always entertained getting one, but never had the guts to go through with it in reality. In games, he didn't really think about it because he was focused on missions and earning credits. Thoughts flowed to Mina, and he smiled to himself. So, you know, I think you can tell by my appearance what my favorite scene in the book was. Uh, it was obviously the clown porn scene. <laughs> it was so funny. And all I have to say is that once you hear it, you really won't be able to get it out of your head. I'm sure if you read it, it's going to be stuck in your noodle for some time. And it isn't that the book, it isn't that that's all the book is about. And I don't want you to paint that picture. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of just give this an homage because I do that. Like, if you remember my, my uh, Hobgoblin Riot thing, I got dressed up to look like Popper. Had my little Viking hat on, the one horn, and and all that stuff. Had the the hair, and I, I wore bathrobe for the bathrobe night, um, just because I have to respect things. And when I, I something touches me deeply, I I, I reciprocate. So um, the the scene is something that really once you you read it or see it, it it's just going to stick with you forever. I mean, like I seriously. I think about that scene probably once a day. You know, if I start thinking about doing audiobooks, uh, and especially getting ready for this this special, I kept thinking about that scene. It was amazingly silly and funny, um, and it fit. It was it was a perfect thing um, for what what you know she did. So I have to say, Eden Red, my hat is off to you. I don't have a little clown hat, or I, I would have worn that for you too. But I I have the nose, so. Um, I do want to say that's that. Now, like I said, I don't want to distract from the story, um, but it was it was there. So I just want to throw it out there and just make sure you realize it's it for if for no other reason. That scene makes the entire book worth everything, and I would say that if they threw that into the Lord of the Rings, you know, if they threw that in the Lord of the Rings, like for the the fifty seven years or whatever it is that that like Sam Wise is the the mayor of Hobbiton and he's rebuilding things, they they, they just said, okay, here's where the, the clown porn scene is. I would have said, Tolkien, you're a genius, because it is just too funny. Anyway, Digital Hearts starts off. So let me get to my serious mode. <laughs> See I fooled you. Um, Digital Hearts starts off with some players complaining, uh, completing one game and being invited to join a new game called, you know, Digital Hearts uh, that deals with romance and love as well as some rough play sex. It, it also, for some reason, has a serial killer, a player, but he's he's a, a serial killer. It, it's just weird how, how that comes into it. it. It's kind of like Dexter meets the dating game. And I'm trying to think, who was it that showed up on the dating game that was a serial killer? I mean, that actually happened. There was the dating game, and then there was a serial killer who was on the dating game that, that won the thing, I think. Um, won the date. I can't remember. Uh, I'm, I'm getting old now. I just turned 50, so my brain is shut off. But it, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like a mashup of Dexter and Debbie Does Dallas. Uh, I'm sorry, I like alliteration, so I, you know it's better than Dexter in a dating game. Dexter dating. No, Debbie Does Dallas. Okay. Anyway, uh, that's the only porno I know. Honestly, if you ask me pornos, I can tell you Debbie does Dallas. Uh, aside from a clockwork orgy, orgy, um, because that is just art house, uh, and you know, clock house, uh, uh, a clockwork orange is one of the greatest movies ever made, and that's a naughty movie too. Um, so, clockwork orangey and Debbie does Dallas. Past that, I couldn't tell you another porn title. I could probably make some up for you if you want. But anyway, 
The story centers on the killer, who is often referred to as the player, um, who is torn between two girls. One is a dirty girl who wants him to join her team, and another is a much nicer girl who isn't above helping a guy bury a dead body. You know, um, so you can root for who you like. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, there is no right or wrong choice. In fact, the player at the end of the book has to make a choice between the two of them. That's part of the, the game itself is, you know, finding a mate and finding love and that sort of thing. So he's got to make a choice. He can't be playing, you know, two chicks and whatever forever. He's got to come down. And the funny thing is that each of them are part of a faction. Wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. and I don't want to give things away. Um, so anyway, um, he has to make a choice, but the game is actually shaping reality, too. And they don't realize that. So the choice that's made at the end of the book will probably shock you. And I honestly can say that if I had been told the same things he had been told, I would have probably made the same choice, which would have been bad for everybody because uh, I'm the last person in the world you want to, you know. It's kind of like if we were in New York and Gozar the Gozarian had come down, and I'm told to choose the form of the Destroyer, it sure as hell wouldn't have been the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. It would have been really bad. It would have been like the zombie blob apocalypse. Um, so you don't want me doing these kind of choices, people. That's all I'm just saying. Anyway, I, it, was, it was a good choice, and I like how the book ended. Um, very much not what you expect from a book... That is about naughtiness and digital hearts. It's about relationships and romance, uh, as in what you're supposed to do in the game. Okay, um, I'm not saying that's what the game or what the book is about, but uh, the, the the book itself reminded me more of The Sims. I mean, if you virtualized yourself into a game and was able to earn money and power in the real world, that would kind of be The Sims. You know, um, something is off with the real world. I don't want to say what it is, but I do have to say that, that Digital Hearts sort of blurred some lines between the game and the real world. Um, whenever someone died, they did not return. So it was kind of a permadeath. That was a factor to it uh, because the player does go around whacking folks, you know, and he's, he's got people helping him bury the bodies. Um, and, and he has sex after that or before that and then after that. Uh, so there's, there's different things that happen. But anyway, uh, the player does a lot of stuff in the game and and it's funny well I'll, I'll get to the funny stuff in a minute i will say this is more game lit okay more game lit than crunchy lit rpg because there are a ton of mechanics involved um and I, I must say the most obvious way that i was reminded of this was a game was by like hearts peering over the heads of other players or receiving notification of your social standing now here's what i was going to get to for example, I can't recall if it was like a charisma or attractiveness increase, but it would increase by performing certain social tasks. Now, you're asking me, what do I mean by that? And, you know, the easiest thing for me to give you as an example is, um, well, let me just say this. I, I have to laugh. <laughs> because I can tell this book was written by a woman, even if I didn't know it was a woman before I got the book, um, simply because of... The social clues that go on. For example, one character gets a boost just for listening. That's right, just for listening, which is something that few men ever caught on to. Uh, you know, like he sits there and listens to somebody talk, and his attract attractiveness or his charisma, whatever it was, it, it, it increased by a point just because he listened to somebody talking. He didn't interject, didn't tell him about himself, didn't stop and interrupt. And, and this is something I've told my son for years. Yeah, I, I've told him, when you take a girl out, don't talk about yourself, ask about her and just pay attention. Listen and then ask her questions about herself that is from the, the things she's just said. And just listen and you'll remain mysterious. Um, and he listened to me and bam, he now has a girlfriend. So I'm not as dim as I look, at least not at the moment. I mean, the... Here, I can make myself look dumber. Um, okay, so um, the game works on real life principles. And like I say, and I, I don't mean to sound negative or anything like that, but that is a woman's perspective because a man, I, I don't, I mean, like I realize this, but a man would never ever make that be like a game mechanic, you know, listening. And there's other things that happen throughout the book. And, and, and it's something like I've learned only because I've lived to be as old as I am about how women 
want to be wooed, if you want to use that as a term, um, and how, how they can be given attention. And certain things that pop up throughout the book are exactly things that I, I know that a, a woman has either said to me or explained to me or taught me about women because I used to work with nothing but ladies. Uh, so I had like a really good pool to uh, get information from. Um, so it works on real life principles, you know, actual things that turn women on. That could have been like it turns the chicks on and that's how it works. So anyway, this story, <laughs> it's got a whole lot happening to it. I mean, there's just stuff everywhere. It's just, it's going on. And it kind of works out to be like the brainchild of like Lynch, Barker, Lovecraft, Cronenberg, and is a weird, wild th- amalgamation that comes up with a nice twist ending. Um, the sex scenes, I have to say, are really solid. Okay, I'm just I'm just putting it out there. And and while I usually jest about the clown stuff a little, it was intriguing and maybe a little arousing. So if you're interested in some down and dirty sex, um, this is certainly an aspect of the book that will will suck you in. No pun intended. Um, she gets pretty graphic, and so, like I say, if I had to, to give it a meter, it's it's nine tenths erect. This is erect. That's not so. Uh, it's it's right about here because it's it's pretty graphic in its description and details. And I'm just talking about going from here onto to this up. So maybe ninety percent up is that better? I, I'm not trying to be naughty, but um, it, it's it's very very. If you're looking for graphic content. It's there. It's there. Um, so if you're looking for that all into itself, it's it's there. If you're looking for um, game action, it's there, especially at the beginning of the book where they're in the other game. Uh, it's there, there. And then, you know, you have the other stuff, which kind of trims back a little bit on the gaming things. Now, and I'm not trying to downplay it at all, but it didn't seem like it was crunchy. And again, I, I don't need a crunch for me to be satisfied. Um I just need like a little sprinkle of sugar and I'm happy. Uh, like I said, just seeing the digital hearts go off and getting the, the messages and things like that. That's enough to let me know that there's a game being played. They're in a game and, and that's it. So it works. It works for me a lot in that aspect, but it's just not a crunchy, crunchy book. And if you're looking for crunch, you probably won't enjoy this as much as I did. Um, but like I say, if you're there for the story, the story is good. If you're there for the craziness, the craziness is there. Uh, like I say, this is just a mashup of so many things. Like it's like I said, it's like David Cronenberg and 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 you know, Lin- or, yeah, Cronenberg, Lynch, um, Clyde Barker, uh, you know, H.P. Lovecraft. All these people's craziness is kind of just dropped into this book throughout the thing, and then it's kind of sprinkled with like a, a penthouse or. A, uh, hustler mentality. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it kind of goes this, this huge spectrum of things. So it's got something for everybody. It really does. Uh, now, something for everybody, that would lead me into talking about Annalise Rennie, uh, who narrates a story with some sauce and spice and a wink. Um, she tackles this material like a linebacker on steroids and gives it everything she has. Uh, the fact that she did the clown scene so well without turning it into a slapstick, which it very easily could have devolved into, uh, it shows her professionalism and how well she knows how to handle material. Plus, her deep, sexy voice. Oh my God, it's just sexy as all hell. When she starts talking, uh, you're like, yeah, baby. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to say. I'm, okay. I'm married, just so you know. But yeah, she's got a sexy voice when she needs to do it. Hell, I could get one of, you know, I think that she could go onto one of those old Howard 100 shows, like Tissue Time with Heidi, whoever it was, which I have never heard, by the way. I don't have satellite radio, so I've never heard Tissue Time, uh, but I know what it's about. I've heard it talked about, but she could pull off Tissue Time, I think. Uh, and I mean that as a compliment. Um, I, I think that she can do just about anything. She can be serious and silly and sexy. And she does all of that in one book. And she does it pretty damn flawlessly. Like I said, she comes at this like she is on the back 90 running down all the way to the 10-yard line on the opposing team. And she takes out all the special teams people and just ganks, ganks the ball carrier. Just knocks him the hell out because... She hits this like 
she is targeted, you know, with a laser pointer on how to do this. She is really good with this. And, and I want to just do this for a second. Okay, I'm going to take this off just so I can be serious. Um, so in all seriousness, um, Annalise Rennie really makes this book work. I, I'm not saying this, I'm not trying to say the book wouldn't work without her, but I mean, she really, really pulls this up and keeps it all cohesive because I think another narrator, and, and we have narrators out there that are good, but there, I can't say every narrator could pull off what she did. Um, so she really crushes this. My final score is eight stars. I, I think that it's good. It's got a good twist. Uh, it's definitely got the sex to it. So if you're looking for sex, it's there. It's got the funny, which I enjoy, the funny, the silly. Anything that just kind of goes, you know, we're, we're not going to do this the normal way, makes me smile. And and this book did that with me, with the clown scene. That just that scene alone just made it well worth everything else in that book. And it's not that long. It's just a really brief little shocking scene. Uh, and like I say, I'm not trying to say that's all this book is about. But it just shows me how smart and how well written Eden Red, Red actually is because... There was no need to put that into the story. And, and, you know, she could have done anything else, but she she chose to take a chance and put something silly in there during a very serious moment. I mean, extremely serious. I mean, this is like, there is like layers of danger when this is happening. And I, I really give her kudos, which I, I've been saying that a lot lately, but I give her kudos because I think that she did this really smartly, and Annalise Rennie played it out perfectly. So my, my final score is eight stars. I think that there was a couple little kinks and clacks here or there, um, story-wise, that I think kind of slowed it up a little bit, um, but nothing horrible, like I say. So I'm going to say eight stars. It was a really good, enjoyable book, and I do recommend it to other people. Okay. Honey, I miss you a lot, and I think you are hot. Baby, won't you please come home? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was recording already. So let me just put that down, and maybe we can get started with the show, shall we? Um, this is going to be... Asabi! Light. That's right. This is a sound booth spotlight. One of two on the show. One of two. Uh, this is going to be basically a focus on Supers X Heroes number three. What? Uh, a game lit space opera written by Jamie Hawk, narrated by the SBT Naughty staff, or I should say the burlesque people, with Justin Thomas James. The smoothest mofo around. Jeff Hayes, Yvonne Sin, and Carly Crawford. With a book length of five hours and 20 minutes. Started, but Charm put a finger to my lips. Shimmer? Charm said, holding up the glass of water. You're new here, kind of. I just wanted to get you used to the way we do things. Is that normal? Not at all. But it works, for us. We haven't all discussed this. Twitch said to the new gal. I'm not really sure what she's even going on about. You'll fit in fine. Can everyone please hush and let me get this going before our enemies arrive and we have to go kill them all? Charm said, flustered. When she saw they were backing off, she smiled again and said, Breaker here's thirsty. I happen to want him to lick my breasts because I can't seem to go five minutes since I got back without thinking about his lips and tongue and... Well, you get the picture. So... She started to undo her top reaching behind to unzip and then pull it down in spite of the grunts of confusion from the other ladies. Hey, gang. Do you know what time it is in Bangkok? Neither do I. I, I couldn't tell you. But I can tell you it's time for the Sound Booth Spotlight of the Day. What, what, what? Yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my best imitation of Justin Thomas James. What, what, what? You know, he does what, what, what? I can't do him. I'm not even going to go back on that sentence, okay? Um, let me just... Step past out a little bit. Yeah, that's going to be two for the show. This is one. And there's another one coming up later with Heroic Villain with Charles Dean. 
I know. I try to space them out, but damn if SBT don't bring those sexy out so often, I didn't have a choice. I really didn't have a chance. I mean, I've got so many SBT books that I could have put in here. It has the sexy going on. I mean, just the fact they got Annie Ellicott and Lori Catherine Winkle. Just putting those people in a book alone is sexy. So I'm going to just skip past that before I get myself in trouble with my wife. I'm just trying to, to tell her certain things. And, and here I am talking about two hot ladies who know how to narrate a story. Anyway, back on business. I have to say I'm, I'm really enjoying this series a lot. And I think that it's gotten better in book three. I, you know, I think the last book we were missing Charm for way too much of the story. And Charm is one of the characters who holds the book together for me. Um, she is the harem core. She picks up the story. You know, the story picks up right where we left off with Breaker and his team trying to get to a location that will not only impede their enemy, but it will help them in the long run. But when they get there, things don't work out as planned, and not everybody makes it out alive. So it's not one of those things that you just kind of see this is going to come and do things. Um, it, it happens pretty quickly, you know, and, and it's just pow, pow, pow. Um, you don't know it's happening until it's over. Um, so, yeah, there are people who die. I'm not going to say who they are or how important they are to the story, but people don't make it, and it does cause problems. Now, this is one of those books that somehow, rather smartly, and again, I have to say, if, you, if you're talking to me about, like, my rating system of, you know, limp to here, um, this is this is one of those books that's pretty much right here. I mean, it's 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 a 9 or 9.5 out of 10 on the, the score here um, because it makes sex integral to the plot, which is not easy to do. I mean, really, if you think about it, how do you make somebody having to have sex every so often necessary for a story? I mean, you can do it. I mean, you have harems that, oh, oh, and so we stopped and I had to have sex. Or like in, in Dan the Barbarian, there's a scene where he gets captured by like this wind elemental chick. And she's like, you have to let me have sex with you before I let you go on and I'll help you do things. And if you do this, then then I will help you in, in so many ways in the future. and You'll always get stronger and so on. So, so yeah, he had to have sex to do that. But to do this on a consistent basis throughout one single story with multiple women, it's hard. Um, but but Hawk does it smartly. Um, it's part of Breaker's powers. He, he, he has sex, and he draws in the abilities of the people he has sex with. And he's able to mix and match, you know, their powers. So, you know, he, he really can't do more than X number of people at a time because it muddies up his powers. So it's better for him to like do like, you know, maybe four or so, you know, at any given moment and, and keep things the way, you know, that he, he knows. Uh, because after you get to like number five or even number six, it just gets to be overwhelming and he doesn't really have control over his powers and nothing works the way he, like it should. So um, it's, it's pretty necessary to the plot that sex occurs. So, if the sex occurs pretty frequently, it better be damn hot sex. And I have to say, it is. It's 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 pretty much there. It, it is a solid, solid sexy story. And you you get out of it what you expect, okay? Most harem books simply include sex as part of the staff. But like I say, Breaker, he's got reasons he has to do it. Uh, the, the sex is fairly graphic in depiction, but not off-putting. Um, and I will say that Book one, in, in certain ways, seemed a bit harsher, um, especially concerning a certain heavy metal chick who only wanted her sex given to her one way. Um, in this book, the sex has become a little something more. It has more depth and emotion to it, and so it actually elevates above being above the, the porn type event. And I think Breaker needs a big mustache like this. I think he needs a porn stash, you know? Um, even if I was doing porn, I wouldn't have a mustache like this. It's just in the way. I just don't know how people wear big, thick beards and mustaches. Like, you know, Charles Dean gets on me about my grandpa beard. But, honestly, my beard is, is it's under control. It's tamed. It's under control. But it will attack if necessary. Um, this is just too much. I, I think I think this is too much. So, like I say, I'm getting old and it don't look good like this. So, I'll keep it trimmed up from this point forth. But, um, the sex here... <laughs> Um, is actually gaining emotion and, and gravitas. Uh, 
so that it, it kind of goes above being just a standard porno type or graphic sec type story. Uh, Breaker and his ladies all care for one another, as most harem characters should. Uh, I, I think having a harem with which, with characters who are just lackadaisical in their sexing, sexing, I'm so old, and and they're they're getting it on. Maybe I don't know. Anyway, when they have sex, if they just they just do it as a matter of course, and there's no no emotion to it or no feeling then it's just not as intriguing or as important and you really get that with some of the books you know like, well, we just did this because you know blah 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 um that isn't the story it's, it's not just sex intermingled with awesome superhero action and antics although mainly it pretty much is just that like sex and then superhero action and antics and then sex and so but there's actually a story to this there really is uh, and it's also set in space so if I think about it for just a second, um, I have to say it's kind of as if Peter Quill uh, was getting in along with Gamora, you know, Gamora, Nebula, and Mantis, Sands, Rocket, Groot, and Drax, you know. So the Guardians of the Galaxy, it has a whole other meaning if you go that route uh, with just Peter and those three. <laughs> Peter, I know. Uh, anyway. This book is shorter in length. Short in length. She didn't say that last night. That's not what she said. Uh, this book is shorter in length than most novels. But it's fast-paced and filled with steamy action as well as superpower battles. And I do believe that Hawk plans on writing quite a few of these books before he wraps up the tale. So the shorter length actually makes it feel serialized and episodic. Um, and the story keeps me occupied and wanting more. So I'm all for that. I mean, I have no problem with it being short blurbs. I'm, I'm actually getting into a point now where um, nine, seven, five-hour books in that range frequency really appeal to me a lot because I've got this to do, and I have a life, and having a 14- or 24-hour book, sometimes I, I, I used to be like, oh, man, I just love these things. But that's before I did all this other stuff. I have so much happening now um, that a book that takes me over 10 hours to listen to or 14 hours, it can be a little bit daunting. And I, I have to really force myself to stretch into it. But a quick read like this, it's perfect. It's, it's right there for me. Uh, and that's not saying I'm not going to do books that are longer in length. I'm, I'm happy to listen to them. But you got to realize a 19-hour book can take me at least two days to listen to. If I have nothing else happening other than work, if I'm not working, then I don't have time to do it because my wife is home and she expects me to pay attention to her and my children and the dog. The dog has to go for walks so I can listen to that, you know, on the walks. But my dog really prefers country music. So um, I kind of have to, to focus on things. So shorter story lengths actually work well for me. And like I say, I, I think the story works really well in that format. I think it it, it works out pretty well. And it, it kind of reminds me of um, Cherry Blossom Girls by Harmon Cooper. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of thing. You know, the MC loves his ladies. They love him. And the sex is hot and steamy and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it's very much in that, that quality of writing and so on. But this is its own little story. And like I said, it's Guardians of the Galaxy in space making porno. So Peter and Gamora make a porno would be the, the best analogy. The SBT burlesque girls clean house in sexy maid uniforms while JTJ plays another suave mother. Shut your mouth. What? Honestly, JTJ, Justin Thomas James. Can I just say, Justin Thomas James is so smooth. He is frictionless. Frictionless. This man is suave as all get out. He, he, actually, whenever I think of Justin Thomas James, I always go back to that guy. It's like, I am the most interesting man in the world. The most interesting man in the world. That's Justin Thomas James. He plays off that smooth, well-dressed, intelligent, controlled man. You know, um, so if I, you know, I, I, I think of Justin Thomas James, I think of beer commercials. Um, yeah. That's it. I think of beer commercials. Um, but anyway, I think I actually have a picture of Justin Thomas James when he was trying out for that role. And he actually came to a realization that he was too good for the part. Do you have that, Ramon? Can you put that up? I mean, tell me he doesn't fit right in. I mean, if, if he couldn't have played that part any better, I don't know who could have. 
but he had things. He had commitments. He couldn't do it. So for me, Justin Thomas James is the most interesting man in the world. He is the suavest, smoothest cat that there is around. And, and he knows how to tell sexy tales. Like I said, talking about Cherry Blossom Girls. Uh, it's, it's a crossover. See how I bridged that right there? Um, Cherry Blossom Girls, he, he plays, you know, a, a non-breaker kind of guy. He's, he's more normal. But it's still interesting and it works. I mean, just, it just works because he makes it work and the ladies make it work. And I'm not trying to take anything away from them, but, you know, James pretty much is the storyteller here. And, and I have to say there, there's a, there's a, a point where I say I, I would rather have my uh, adult books, like, and I don't mean like Playboy or Penthouse or anything like that. I would rather have my adult books read to me by a woman than a man. But Justin Thomas James is one of those people that I don't even notice that he's narrating naughty parts. Um, I don't mean he reads naughty bits. I, I mean, he, he narrates sections of a book that contain graphic adult subjects. Okay. Um, because I just lost my train of thought because just thinking about him reading some of these naughty bits. Um, anyway, I, him reading those things to me, usually I would say it throws me off because just having some dude randomly tell me stories about his sex life does not do things for me. Um, but he is so smooth. It never even clicks in my head what he's doing. It really doesn't. Um, it, just, it just does not come into play. Whereas I've read other books, or I should say listened to other books, with that sort of subject, and I just always kind of get kicked in the head and kind of put off with um, the storytelling because it's a guy reading me the story. So, you know, he, you know, he may play the naive hero to a T, but it's the gals that make you believe Breaker has it going on. Like I say, the ladies tease and titillate. Yes, I like that word today. They titillate with their voices to a point that is just not fair, okay? Um, just not fair, but, you know, you, you will leave. Um, there's, a, there's a medical condition. I think after you listen to this book, um, there's a medical condition. It's, it's what's it, indigo nuts? Um, violet grapes? No. Blue, blue? I can't remember. It's something to do. But all I know is... You, you're, you're, they hurt after you, you don't, and then, uh, and, and so, um, yeah, they do that to you. They, they give you that condition because they're just that good. Uh, I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just telling you the way it is. They're supposed to be making you go, oh my God, this is so hot. And they do it. They do it. So anyway, the final score is 8.1 stars. The series maintains an even kill as it goes along, and it's just getting... If it's not maintaining the course, I would say it's actually improved a little bit since the last book. So, you know, keep it up, and, and go out and get the book. It's an enjoyable series. Okay, folks, you know what time it is? That's right. It's time for another... Samu! <laughs> Sorry, had to just mix that up a little bit. Um, this sound based spotlight is The Heroic Villain by Charles Dean, narrated by Jeff Lays, Annie Hellahot, Justin Thomas Games People Play, and Aphrodisiac Renee, with a book length of 14 hours and 48 minutes. From how loud that is and how much it sounds like a saw, whatever we're about to face is huge. It's rude to call a lady big. The voice hissed. A clicking sound filled the room and bounced around the chamber this time, making it impossible for Lucas to discern its origin. Where in the hell are you? Even if we are big, no one wants you to point out what we already know. <laughs> The grating speech was punctuated by a loud, clicking laugh. The cords! Lucas realized that the giant, arm-thick, silk-like strands hanging throughout the room were resonating as the creature spoke, making it seem as if her voice was coming from all directions at once and leaving the three of them turning about endlessly as they tried to find her. 
Lucas wasn't sure how conductive the chords might be, but he wanted to test a small theory. So I'm sorry, I really kind of had to naughty up the narrators just a little bit since this book technically lays, you know, lacks on, lacks on the naughty bits a little bit, but it lays it on just a little bit there, like mayonnaise on bread. It's there, but it's not all that um, because he does have some naughty sections, but it doesn't go deep into it. Um, so I do want to say, first of all, this was Jeff Hayes, Justin Thomas James, Annie Ellicott, and Annalise Rennie, which is an amazing, can I just say that, an amazing crew of people to get together. It just blows my mind that they're all together in this. Uh, so, you know, with the special guest appearance by Annalise Rennie. I never thought I would see that at Sound Booth. Uh, I was surprised to hear that Andrea Parsnow was doing something like that. So this was just as surprising and shocking and just mind-boggling blowing. <laughs> blowing. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to include this in the show for a couple of reasons. First, it's because we do have a naughty MC who is the villain of the story rather than the hero. So it kind of, kind of turns things around and, and flips things over and smacks it around a little bit, um, just like a naughty person should. Secondly, because Charles Dean does like to create harems and, and then make you want action to take place, even if you never get to see the action. Uh, third, um, you know, he, he s does certain things that this book is such a departure from what he usually writes, you know, because usually uh, there is barely any... There's, like in this book, there's barely any beer at all. Um, and there is one, like, one section where there's a beer talked about or popped and drank. Uh, but there's not a lot of beer, and there's nary a strip of bacon to be seen. I mean, I have my binocs out looking around and could not see it. There's a pair of boobies in there over the bacon, which I understand that. I would take that over bacon any day. But, um, well, it depends on whose they were. Like, Arnold Schwarzenegger today, no. No. Although those are probably standard... Well, you understand. But anyway, um, there is a strip of bacon. So, there, like I said, there is a sultry bathtub scene that is nicely descriptive, but don't really go looking for other types of naughtiness. I'm including this here just because he does have harem stuff. Uh, as he goes through the book, uh, there are women that kind of vie for his affection, and the one is kind of close to him and, and things like that. So it's not straight up harem and there's not a lot of sex, but because it's a villain in the hero section, I feel I can include that here. Um, now the book is clever and smartly written. Hmm. Yes, who would have thought? A smartly written, and it centers on a lonely guy mourning a loss and trying to just spend his days drifting about in the game world, doing nothing but drinking wine and eating cheese, until he learns that the game he does nothing in but loves dearly is going to be shut down. Now, any other player would just kind of move on and go to a new game, but not the MC, Lucas. Lucas has very special reasons, which I really probably shouldn't give away, for not wanting to see this particular game world die off, and it's because of a very, very special NPC, uh, who's really not an NPC, it's a dev playing an NPC, but he doesn't know that, and so on, so either way, either way, he ends up pairing up with this dev, to figure out a new way to draw the players back into the game without any new content being developed. And it's kind of like, you know, we don't really want to have to put any work into this, so let's just get this uh, on our own and, and see if we can't bring players in, or otherwise the game's done. So Dean is pretty slick in the way that he handles a few things in the book. Uh, for example, negative levels. Uh, the way he does that, because Lucas is known as negative. Uh, because he's died so many times and lost so much XP, he actually goes into negative numbers. He's at like negative 79 when the book starts. And there are things that he discovers after the fact that um, kind of gives him a cheat that no one else has ever discovered because who in the hell lets their player die uh, enough that they lose negative 79 levels uh, you know, you die and then you go back and rebuild where you're at. You know, most people, because he's a loner and he gets killed by people periodically and has things happen, um, he just he, he just runs with it and deals with it. Uh, he really doesn't care what his level is. Does not care. Uh, so his uncaring attitude about the game and the, everything up until that point actually plays in his favor. Uh, so it's pretty smart. Um, and as always, um, he has Lucas do things that 
you wouldn't think an MC lead should do. Uh, for example, he portrays a party right off the bat. I mean, I don't try to give anything away, but it kind of goes into the story itself. Um, so he does that. Um, and he also, he always creates characters that titillate. <laughs> I titter as I titillate. Uh, but anyway, he titillates the reader. But for me, the BDSM mercenary was my favorite, Bonnie. That's her name. I loved her. Uh, if I had to pick a favorite, then she would be it. But there's also, like, there's always the sympathetic girl um, that he uses kind of in a way. That, and, and this is played by his game-changing accomplice, who is more than she seems and closer than he realizes. Now, I especially enjoyed a few things about the book, such as the fat spider. Now, you, you know, I love spiders. They're, they're something I really enjoy. I, I, I like the spider tales. Um, and there's also a flying gorilla, but the spider sabah made me laugh consistently. There's a, there's a body-conscious spider who's worried about being fat-shamed, and she shames herself because of her size. Uh, so a body-shamed spider is not something you see every day. So like I say, the story is whip-smart, and it's, it's crafted meticulously and leaves you wanting more. Now, I'm going to go into the SBT crew. They add in a ton of SFX, sound effects, for you lay people. <laughs> lay people. You probably want to lay people. I'm sorry, this is that naughty episode. I'm down to the end and I'm kind of getting crazy. So anyway, <laughs> the lay people out there. SFX is sound effects. Um, or is it special effects? Damn it, now I don't know. For now, it's going to be sound effects, okay? Um, oddly, there was one bit of the book with the sound that bothered me a little bit. And it was the drumming during the battle scenes. And I've, I've, I've praised this before where they have music come up during the battles and it kind of adds drama and things like that and tension. Here, it was a little distracting. I don't know if it was the drumming as opposed to what there was before, but it, it really kind of threw me off a little bit. Like, it, it, it caused a hitch in my giddy-up, if you know what I mean. Um, now, again, it's nothing that's overwhelming, but every time it happened, I mean, like, every time it happened, it, it just kind of like, I was like, oh, here comes that music again. And I don't ever do that with SBT. So it was kind of weird. Um, but I think it, it's fine. I think everybody that I know that has, has talked about it since I've, I've read to listen to the book has told me it didn't bother them at all. But for me, it, it did kind of throw me off. I liked more of the, the other kind of instrumental stuff that was done in the other books, um, like, you know, with the, the Dragon Book with Justin Thomas James and things like that. Uh, I think it worked much better there than it did here. Um, it just, for some reason, to me, it was out of place. But it wasn't a game changer. It did throw me off when I, when I started up, but otherwise, just amazing. The, the book is just amazing. Uh, there are so many different sound effects, like when they're in a bar or a tavern, rather, and they're talking and things, and there's background stuff. All of that, the sound effects of doors, and, and it, it just it, it flows so, so well. Um, so I have to say, in addition to all that, kudos kudos for including the ever amazing Annalise Rennie in the book that was just like the chocolate sauce on my whipped cream banana split I can never get enough of Rennie uh, and to hear her paired up with SBT was a really special moment for me um, Hayes is just fun, fun and he takes like a rather morose Lucas and turns him into a conniving villain, villain role pretty believably now JTJ Justin Thomas James yeah yeah um the smoothest cat around, if I haven't said that already, which you know I have. Um, he just has fun with his role as the betrayed gamer. And uh, Annalise fits right in with the SBT team. I mean, like I said, this is this is a team up I could see happening again in the future for, for reasons. Uh, personally, I think they get better every time they do a new book. Uh, so, like I say, the book is really good. It's, it's smart. It's got amazing characters. Now, one thing I do want to say about this... Um, I had, I had finished the book, and I had, had been talking because Charles Dean sang a birthday song on my birthday for me. And he asked me what I thought of the book, and we, and we were discussing things. And I didn't give anything away. I didn't say, like, here's my score or anything like that. But he just asked if I'd read it and what I thought about it. And I said, well, you know, you left things open. And he's like, no, 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 no. I, I concluded that book decisively. At the end of the book one, it was concluded because I said, well, you know, I knew immediately there was going to be a book two and book three, probably. And he said, nope, nope, nope. It was conclusively, this was it. It was closed out. And, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, I, I know maybe in his mind, but if you get to the end of the book and you read it, tell me what you think about how conclusively closed that, that book is. Um, I think it's it's got a lot of opening left there, a lot of play and wiggle room and things like that, because... 
just just for an example, okay, one of my favorite bits about the book is how Lucas sort of stumbles into this quest to become a vampire. Like, he accidentally does one thing, and then he does a second thing. It's like two out of five things in order to do this vampire line. And that was never completed. So I said, well, there's an opening right there. Like, I, I don't see Dean starting this and just throwing it out there and not having it conclude somewhere. It's a good lead. It's a good opening for book two or even maybe end up in book three. Uh, and like I say, at the end of book one, there's a lot of talk about things happening elsewhere and doing other things with the survivors. Because I don't want to tell you if anybody lives or dies, but th they go a certain route. And there's no doubt in my mind that this was going to be a, 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 a series as opposed to a single story. So I will s agree to disagree with you, Charles. I, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, and that's why I didn't say anything then. I told you I'm not erudite. I'm not really smart. And I, I try not to, to dispute things with, with smarter people than I. But um, it was pretty obvious to me that this was going to be a series, which is good. I like the book. I like the, the whole story, the premise. I think it's really smart, and I think it works well. And I think there's too much stuff left unanswered at the end of that book for it to have not been planned just a little bit in the back of your mind. Maybe you're denying it for yourself, but it really is there to say, hey, this is going to be an epic series. Epic. And, you know, you're, you're in, you know, you're in competition with like War Returnus. So you've got to do things. You gotta keep going. And this is a good way to have like another series running at the same time. And it also gives you an impetus to say, okay, I can conclude War Returnus and be okay and go on to this other thing. And, and and you've got games you can play and books you can bounce back and forth. Um kind of like Dave Wilmarth, what he did with like Greystone Guild and like the land of the undying. Uh, because, you know, The Land of the Undying uh, came out as Greystone was still going on. Uh, now he has Greystone gone, but he has Land of the Undying as an addition to the Shadow Sun Survival series. So, you know, he's he's got himself a plan. He's got books staggered. And you're doing the same thing. You can't fool me. But anyway, um, that's near here, there, there. Uh, what I will say is the final score is 8.6 stars. I think it was a really amazing book. Um, it's super awesome with great surprises, both story-wise and in the narration. Uh, like I said, I hadn't even paid attention that Annalise was in the story. And when I heard her, I was like, that sounds like Annalise. And then when I was getting ready to get this done, I was like, I knew I, I, knew I was right. That was her. So... So, you know, like I said, I, I, I put the book together and, you know, the, 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 the things that we look through is going to say, you know, here's who did what. I was like, there's Annalise Riney right there. So, can't fool me. I heard her. And that's it. So, 8.6 stars. Go out and get it. It's a really good book. It's a smart book. And it's going to be an amazing series if the first book is any indication. Hoo-wee. Now, that was something. I don't know about you all, but I sure think I need a cigarette and a drink after all that. I was hoping to do like 11 reviews, but I know the show is pretty much long enough. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> um, anyway, I hope you all had fun uh, with these bad boys and gals of the Game Lit community. So hold on, hold on. Okay. Um, so... Uh, as Mr. Rogers is want to say, thank you very much for watching, everybody. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. If you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share and like the video. Please, as always, leave comments or suggestions in the section below. I do, do, do listen as the show, this show was requested by some of the listeners. Um, and so feel free to tell me whatever you want, and maybe I'll be able to fulfill your, your fondest fantasy. Um, I know this is a naughty special, but I have to have to draw the line somewhere. I is a married man, but if it can be done with the show, I'll probably do it for you. Um, so feel free to tell me whatever you want or make a request. Uh, we still have the dungeon special coming soon, uh, so just remember, I enjoy the feedback a lot. I like interacting with everybody, and again, you can always follow us on Facebook or Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Uh, we're all over the place. We are like eczema everywhere. Um, so just remember, everybody, 
This is the show that you go to for audiobook reviews. Uh, I'm Ray. Keep listening.